Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Sandy Sedgbeer, who's here to share with us her life on the edge of Ohm. While many of us are familiar with Sandy Sedgbeer at Ohm Times Radio, do we have insights into who she really is? Today, Sandy's going to share with us her life and her journey. So Sandy Sedgbeer is a veteran broadcaster, author, media consultant, and professional journalist who cut her teeth in the ultra-competitive world of British newspaper and magazines. She has interviewed some of the world's leading thinkers, scientists, and celebrities. So let's welcome to the show, Sandy Sedgbeer. Thank you very much, Marianne. What an honor it is to have you here and just to spend this time together. I mean, we've known each other for some time, and I was just so intrigued by your work and your history. Why don't you share a little bit about your background with us? Oh, my goodness. Um, Do we have that much time? I think we do. <laughs> okay, so my background is um, journalism publishing. That's what I, where I started my career in British magazines, um, and later on went on to um, write a number of books. Um, and also because I was so interested in how um, the other side of magazines, not just the editorial side, but the marketing, the promotions, the advertising, you know, the whole kit and caboodle, I got very much involved in actually um, conceiving and producing magazines for various clients, which took me into advertising, television, and, you know, I had this wonderful journey all around the media. And that was pretty much my career. So what started you, because I know you were with Ohm Times, what started you in just having an interest in that world of consciousness, spirituality? Um, I think I had always had some kind of interest. I didn't know where that interest came or where it was leading. I used to ask strange questions that indicated there was some something there. Um, and probably from about the age of 15, I really started reading a lot of esoteric books really esoteric books. I came across people who had some of the Keys of Solomon and some of those very old books who loaned them to me. And um, I thought I thought that I was trying to disprove something. You know, I was very sceptical, very sceptical. Um, it took a long, long time before I finally realized I was actually trying to remember something. And as I'm working my way through all of these books through a few decades, it was a feeling of, oh, that fits. I don't know what it fit, but it fitted something. And that doesn't fit. And eventually in 1987, which I later learned was the year of the harmonic conversion, I suddenly had this experience of knowing, Um, knowing what I knew and knowing that I hadn't been looking for information, I'd been looking to remember something. And so from there, what had you following, continue to following the path of this consciousness? Well, once I had that, I mean, wherever I worked, I was known as a bit of a witch, witch, they used to call me because people didn't understand why I was interested in all of this, uh, you know, metaphysical material. They all thought it was a bit weird. Um, But I was very much working in the mainstream and writing books that were in the mainstream. So my my closet spiritual life was very, very, you know, separate from that. But after 1987, it became very apparent to me that I wasn't satisfied any longer working in the arenas that I was working in and writing the kinds of books that I'd been writing. I felt that there was something more meaningful out there. And then I remember that the um, the movie, um, What Dreams May Come, um, was released. And I just thought, wow, you know, that's the first time I'd watched a truly spiritually oriented movie. And I got the sense that there was, um, you know, it, everything was about to change. And um, around about the same time, I also, by a series of real interesting synchronicities, found myself able to um, go to live in America. 
uh, which to me was was the Mecca. You know, that's the place where all the spiritual stuff happened and where all the spiritual teachers were. So that was really a big turning point for me. And although I was still doing a lot of mainstream corporate work, I very quickly, very quickly found my spiritual tribe and, um, you know, had this baptism in deeply into spirituality when I was offered the opportunity to produce an online spiritual magazine. And that was kind of like my deep dive. And after that, there was no going back. I no longer wanted to do the corporate work I was doing. I decided that I would help the people in the spiritual arena um, build their platforms, their profiles, get their books published and help support them in doing you know, what they were here to do. What do you think is one of the most spiritual experiences that you've had? Oh, well, all of my friends will laugh and say, oh, no, Sandy doesn't have spiritual experiences. That's what I always used to say to everybody. Um, I didn't get that the way I received information was the way I received information. You know, I was looking um, to other benchmarks. Oh, I don't hear angels. I don't see anything. You know, I just know what I know. Um, But I, you know, I wouldn't say that I've had any out-of-body experiences, but I've had many experiences of knowing something and then uh, having that knowing confirmed in a number of different ways. I think it's interesting when we go along our path and we have something profound that happens, whether it's a knowing or spiritual experience or, or what have you, that moves us in another direction. And it, we find out it's the direction we've always been meant to go anyway. <laughs> you know? mm, absolutely. I did have one experience before I completely, you know, kind of severed or started stepping back from the work that I was doing um, and fully begin to embrace the spiritual side of things. I did have one very odd experience when I was being interviewed um, in the north of the England uh, on a big morning television show about one of my books. And on the just as I came off stage, the producer said to me, oh, somebody called into the studio. They know you and they wanted to, um, you know, ask us to pass on their phone number. And I had a three or four hour drive back to London. And I was thinking about this person and how odd it was that, They happened to be watching that particular TV program at that time, and they happened to recognize me, et cetera, et cetera. And then I had what I call an instant download. It was as if somebody dropped um, a movie screen in front of me and condensed 10 minutes of a story run out into two seconds, and I got the whole picture immediately. And I realized that the work that I'd been doing, the books that I was writing, the pursuit of fame, you know, I was definitely pursuing fame back then, um, how how it wasn't serving me and how I was doing all of these things for the wrong reason. Um, It was just a a kind of, you know, um, hit back to my childhood of wanting to prove to people that I was somebody. And in that second, I absolutely got that I had a lot of work to do. Um, And I I started stepping back from, you know, the arena where I was kind of beginning to get quite known and uh, stopped writing the kinds of books that I was writing and decided that I had to dive deeper into the spiritual work. Since then, I have had a couple more of those incidents. I don't know how they happen. I don't know where they come from, but it is as if the universe just says, hey, look at this. And there it all is laid out in front of me. And I look at the picture and go, oh, and I get it within seconds of what it means and what I am to do. Um, So it's it's a nice little um, warning, I guess, a little, you know, alert. It's nice to have those. I call them like little markers in our road. To yes. Let us know we're on the right path. You know? Yes, yes. So we don't get into the weeds somewhere because we, you know I think a lot of us, and I've done this 
quite a few times myself is spend time in the weeds, not really kind of following any path and just trying to figure things out. Mm, yeah. So yeah. You, you had a magazine that you um, had early on. What was the first one that you had? Um, the magazine that I produced when I came to America was an online magazine. Up until then, you know, my business was print magazines. And it had occurred to me as the internet became, you know, just began to really become available to everybody. Wouldn't it be fun to start um, uh, an online magazine? And I wonder if I could take what I've learned and use any of that in a whole other arena. And lo and behold, you know, I was offered that within a couple of months of arriving in America, I was offered that opportunity by a spiritual teacher who had been trying to get one going. And I took it on um, and it was called Planet Lightworker. And it was, um, we kept it going for about 10 years. It was a completely free, for the first few years, magazine, uh, monthly online. We covered all kinds of articles and book excerpts and the spiritual arena with a particular small focus on the children because it became very evident to me that something was happening as far as, you know, the next generations were concerned and we had to keep an eye on that. Um, but I loved producing that magazine. And so was the magazine something that continued from there? What happened to the magazine? No, we we let it die after about 10 years. There was uh, I had started producing another one, which was an expansion of the um children of the new earth section that we had in planet lightworker so i'd started a print magazine and then i had to take that one online and i was spending more time working on free magazines than i was earning my living and i decided that you know i needed to step back from that a little bit but but it's uh, you know it's something that's very 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 dear to my heart and if somebody said to me tomorrow hey you know, I'll back you if you want to start another one. I jump at the chance. Well, isn't that exciting? <laughs> <laughs> Especially with that skill set, because online magazines are not all created equal. And when we look yes. at them, you know, having content that people are really interested in, that must have been a kind of like a, a challenging thing all the time to find. And, you know, it was an interesting exercise because, you know, in the world of, you know, print magazines, especially if you're looking at a monthly or a quarterly or whatever, you've got long lead in times and you know the kind of articles that you're looking for and you're going to do it months in advance and sometimes you'll have themes and sometimes you won't. What I had to learn was that I could not control that magazine. Uh, it was a monthly magazine and sometimes I, you know, stuff would not come in on time and I'd have to stretch the deadline and it was as if Something else was guiding the content because when the stuff did come in, it was always perfect. And um, and I'd get people saying, oh, that came at just the right time for me. Um, so I very quickly had to learn I did not have control of this. It sounds like it was a co-creation with the universe. <laughs> yes. Yes, it definitely was. It definitely was. But I, I think I know who was really in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. I can understand that. You know, again, we're yeah. on these paths and then things happen and it feels like, oh, we should have been here all along. Yes. Yeah. My goodness. Well, and so when we look at just your path in total, I mean, as, as you started out, were your parents religious at all or spiritual at all? No. Um, no, my father died before I was born, so I never knew him, but he certainly wasn't religious or spiritual. My mother, bless her heart, didn't have the time to be anything because she had, you know, several children and another one on the way. Um, what happened to me was um, when I was four, uh, myself and my siblings, um, the four youngest, um, had to go into a children's home for a while. My mother, um, you know, was having difficulty coping financially and in every other way. And it was while I was there, we had a church, um, which was called, um, you know, the uh, uh, Church of England, you know. 
C of E, we used to call ourselves, which is not really a denomination, but it was just, a you know, Christianity. And we who uh, didn't have a specific like Catholic or something else went to this church every week. But occasionally we would go to the Catholic church where, you know, one of the other children was being confirmed. And um, I very quickly began to weigh up the difference between the churches and how everything operated and what they said. And I think I always felt this isn't completely true. You know, there's more to this story than we're being given here. And and I think that's what um, really, um, you know, triggered my interest in metaphysics. I have several friends that were kicked out of Catholic school because they were asking too many questions. Yes. So I understand mm-hmm. that having that inquisitive mind going, well, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. How about this? <laughs> yeah. 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 But but it, what was interesting was I, from a very early age, I had a very, very strong sense of right or wrong, right and wrong. And, um, you know, even if the older children were, um, you know, prodding me and pushing me and, you know, not quite bullying me to do something. If I felt that it was wrong, there was no way I was going to do it. I don't know where that came from. Were there other signs that showed up for you at that <clears throat> time? Not especially. I mean, I was definitely a thinker and an observer, and I was always weighing things up. And I always wanted to know a lot more about people. I was always very curious about people and their stories and why they did the things they did and thought what they did. And people used to say I was a little bit of a queer child, you know, being so curious at that age. I do recall one incident um, when I was playing a game of Superman and I had taken my um, jacket off and, and, and put it around my shoulders and did the top button up around my neck as if it was a cape. And I was running around the playground with some of the other children. And I remember looking at my hand and seeing my hand emerge from the sleeve of my jumper and suddenly being very taken with the appearance of this hand. And looking at it, I mean, this sounds really weird, but looking at it almost as if as if I knew that this hand was a new hand to me. You know, it didn't look the way. I thought it should look. It didn't look old. And at the time, I thought that was a really weird thing, but I couldn't really make sense of it. And it's only now that I look back on it and I think, oh, I wonder if there was a little bit of bleed through there, you know, of, uh, you know, a soul that knows something different. I know we're doing a little bit of moving around the map here, but you have such an interesting story. The last place we left off is you did the magazine. What did you do then? Um, I had the magazine. I was still doing some corporate work at that time. And then I got persuaded to um, or invited to work with the spiritual arena full time. And as a result of that, I then started helping people with books. So I got very much involved in editing, writing, ghostwriting, um, helping later on, helping people self-publish um, and also working with spiritual teachers, helping them build their platforms and profiles. One of the things that I was very um, adamant about, having been in magazines, having worked, actually organised events where I got to meet my readers, you know, this is part of the curious curiosity about who people are and, you know, what they want and the lives they live, I used to always organise events where I could meet my readers. And um, working also in advertising and marketing, I got to use some of that information and that curiosity in changing the way um, some companies communicated with their customers, like mail order companies, direct marketing companies. And I was very adamant that you have to, you have to, be um, very conscientious about who your customers are and um, give them plenty of value for money if you really wanted their business. They couldn't just be a number or, you know, somebody who writes a check. You you really owed them a lot more than you, you know, seemed to be obvious. And so 
I developed this whole thing about resonance marketing. And this is what I was, you know, teaching some of my clients is that the way you communicate with the audience is so important because it's a frequency and they can feel if you're being inauthentic. And so I kind of became a bit known for that, helping clients talk to their, you know, customers and their audiences in um, very um, uh, authentic ways and finding ways where the client could actually have an ex- the audience could have an experience of the client. So utilizing YouTube, utilizing Facebook, utilizing videos and events that they would free events so that people could feel them. Because to me, it's really important if you're in the spiritual arena that you are uh, impeccable, you know, you're impeccable with uh, your word, um, you know, just like the four agreements says. Um, and that's something that people don't always seem to understand. But we only have to look at what's happening with marketing today to see how fed up people are getting with all of these, you know, uh, call call services where you end up spending hours, you know, trying to press buttons to get through to a human being and nobody wants to talk to you and everything is separate. And, um, you know, it's all artificial intelligence, a lot of it. People want real communication. And I think we're in danger of losing that. So that was something that I was quite adamant about wanting to share with my clients. And so I did a lot of that. And um, that's pretty much what I still do. Where do you think people today get a little hung up when it comes to that type of marketing and connecting with people? I think what's happening now, um, we see it all the time, content marketing, um, resonance marketing is beginning to be a thing at last where companies are trying to align themselves with their customers. Um, how how authentic some of them are, I think, um, you know, is questionable. But I do think that so many um, companies have an opportunity that they are completely overlooking, completely. Um, it, you know, as long as they're going to go on doing business with just the profit, you know, sheet as their guide, then they're going to be in big trouble in a few years' time because more and more people are waking up, more and more people understand energy. Um, Even if they don't completely understand it, they know it when they feel it. They know when someone's lying to to them. Uh, Actions speak louder than words, you know. So if you are going to continue to do business in that manner, then I would predict that, you know, give it another 10 years and your business will be dead. It's just so interesting how communication and marketing has changed so much in the last 20 years. When we look at it, it seems that we've really become this very disconnected group of people, even though we're trying to connect with with, uh, our audience or people who are interested in whatever our book or message is. Yes. Yeah. And it is interesting, isn't it, that people said that, you know, when Kindle came along, um, regular publishing would be dead. It isn't dead. Uh, Magazines, there's been a huge uh, resurgence of in the magazine business, mostly niche magazines um, that seem to be doing very, very well. Other more general magazines, not quite so much. But um, it's interesting to me that people people still want connection. and they want connection, especially around the things that they're interested in. You know, we need, we are, you know, we're a social species. We can't cut ourselves off. And when we see this argument that's going on with artificial intelligence and how it's affecting writers and journalists, um, and you look at a news feed and you know straight away uh, that the article hasn't been written by a person because there's, there's too many, you know, problems with the article itself. You can feel the difference. Um, I think we're heading for something that that um, is, you know, there's a big warning here to us. We are beginning to lose our humanity and we have to do everything that we can to keep it. To work on just keeping everything where we're able to learn how to connect with one another. Yeah. You know, was it wasn't long ago I was with a, a 
did a girl's trip and we were up in the New York area at the Statue of Liberty. And it was the most bizarre scene I'd ever seen. People, no one was talking and everyone was doing selfies. <laughs> it was just bizarre. And I was just looking at this going, what is wrong with this picture? Yeah, it's it's not like people are just talking amongst each other. They were there was no talking at all. It was yes. the most bizarre thing. I was in an airport recently, and every and I it made me you know looking around me, every head was bent over a phone, every single one. And I thought, I wonder if we're going to see in five or ten years' time all of these problems with people's necks, um, you know, and their backs, their upper backs. Are they going to start developing these, you know, what they call widow's hump? Because people spend most of their time these days with their head down, looking down at something. And I also noticed how many people were sitting there waiting for their flight. And their one leg was tap, 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 tapping the whole time, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And I thought, wow, what's driving that? You know, there's a, there's this kind of anxiety that people aren't even aware that they're feeling. And I think a lot of it is because because of social media, because of the way our news is delivered so quickly in such short bursts that our brains can't settle on anything. We can't digest anything. You know, we're getting really bad at reflection. Um, there's all this information coming at us all the time. No wonder people's legs are, you know, tapping all the time. Um, how do you deal with that? It's just, they're, it sounds like their body is trying to find a way to process all that nervous energy they're holding. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And if their body is not finding a way to do that, then what's going to happen? Where's, where's all that, you know, distress, that negative energy going? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's part of what we're seeing when people are having these reactions as opposed to, you know, being able to really respond in a situation um, as opposed to just letting the emotions drive. Yeah. Well, I think everybody's in a trance. You know, they're in a trance, whether it's a trance of information or something else. And when something happens around them, they do react. It's a knee-jerk reaction. They don't stop and think. They don't, you know, assess what's really going on. They just react. And often in a very poor way. I mean, look at what's happening on planes. We're hearing about it all the time, the bad behavior. Um, people are getting very badly behaved. Oh, we could spend a lot of time talking about that one. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 <laughs> Don't want to take our time talking about something like that. What I would love to learn more is about like how many books have you done ghostwriting for? Oh, God. Um, I don't know anymore. Um, you know, a few dozen. Um, from some books that I've written the whole thing, um, others has been, you know, a kind of bit of a partnership where I'm uh, helping the author um, by writing certain passages that they find difficult. Um, I've probably, I don't know, worked on hundreds of books altogether in different, different, you know, different levels, different levels. Um, but, you know, books, books are my passion. They really are information. Um, I'm just a you know, sucker for books, always have been. And that's why one of the reasons why I started the No BS Spiritual Book Club, um, because I wanted people to have a trusted source of recommendations. Everybody is curious. Books aren't going away. Um, lots of people are waking up. They definitely want to be informed. You know, they're serious about, you know, their personal uh, spiritual growth and development. And there's an awful lot of books out there. So what I wanted to do was provide people with a library of recommendations from people they can trust, which are usually the authors and the speakers and the teachers that they're following anyway. Um, so, you know, I started the No BS Spiritual Book Club to begin to create that library and also so that we could hear from those authors, speakers and teachers about the books that influence them the most on their life journeys. On that note, we're going to pause here for a quick moment. We've been speaking with Sandy Sedgbeer in regards to her life on the edge of Om. We'll be right back after these messages. 
Are you a coffee lover who wants to make a difference? Look no further than Fire Department Coffee, a veteran-owned business that gives back to support first responders in need. Each batch of coffee is freshly roasted right here in the USA by a dedicated team of first responders and coffee experts. So when you enjoy a cup of Fire Department Coffee, you're not only drinking high-quality coffee, you're supporting members of your community. Start your day with a coffee that gives back. Visit FireDepartmentCoffee.com. That's Fire, D-E-P-T, Coffee.com. Are you looking to entangle life's riddles? Discover the profound teachings of Dr. Shai Tabali, renowned philosopher, best-selling author, and your guide to self-empowerment. With methods that harmonize psychological and spiritual principles, Dr. Tabali's wisdom offers a pathway to holistic transformation. Take that first step today and join thousands globally and embrace the journey to higher consciousness. Visit shytabali.com. That's S-H-A-I-T-U-B-A-L-I.com now. Hello, Dr. Cutler here. Do you experience bloating, heartburn, food craving, bowel irregularity, food sensitivities, weight issues? If you do not digest your food, you may be deficient in macronutrients, which your body needs for optimal health. Dr. Ellen Cutler.com teaches that this is an enzyme deficiency. I believe the most important supplement is a full spectrum digestive enzyme, Dr. Ellen's Way Digestive Enzymes. Hear more about it at Dr. Ellen Cutler.com. Are you chasing profitability yet losing fulfillment? Let me introduce you to your solution, The Relaunch Company. I'm Hillary DeCesar, an entrepreneurial performance coach, fearless leader of The Relaunch Company, here to help put the pedal to the metal and relaunch your business your way. Visit www.therelaunch.com. Take the free quiz to learn three steps towards waving goodbye to burnout and hello to success. The book Terminal Cancer is a Misdiagnosis, authored by Danny Carroll, is on sale at Amazon now. Licensed psychologist and psychotherapist Tessa Antia John Guerra commented, This is one of the most empowering books on a topic of cancer you will ever read. Award-winning author T.L. Needham commented, This recommended book can be understood by anyone seeking answers, hope, and alternatives to a terminal diagnosis. Buy it now on Amazon.com. Are you feeling disconnected from your life and your body as a woman? Do you feel numb emotionally and or sexually and just not sure how to feel really alive again or maybe for the first time? Are you struggling with body and self-acceptance, especially during menopause? If you'd like to reclaim your feminine and learn more about women and gynecology and how it can help empower your life, contact Gina Cloud at www.ginacloud.com. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with our special guest, Sandy Sedgbeer, who's here to share with us her life from the edge of Ohm. Before we went for a break, we were talking about your book club, the No BS Book Club. I'd love for you to share with us what interviews you've done from voices today that have really impacted your journey. Unlike everybody else, um, I recently did an exercise going back three years over the No BS Spiritual Book Club to look at which books had been recommended the most. And what was interesting is that they were all books that had influenced me a great deal on my journey. And I think that what that teaches us is uh, the kind of books that people really gravitate to. Books like The Alchemist, books like The Four Agreements, um, um, you know, those kinds of books, the the books with parables or the books that are very, very simple, straightforward information, like the power of now, you know, um, that we go, duh, yes, because it makes so much sense to us. Um, they're the books that I really, really love and that have impacted me greatly. 
and um, the books that where you can feel that that authenticity running all the way through them. Books that have grounded, practical information that isn't so esoteric that you know you can't even understand it, let alone put any of it into practice. Um, so yeah, the you know the power of now, the four agreements, the the five agreements. Um, Don Miguel Ruiz Junior. Uh, that was I thought was a a fantastic book. Um, the Alchemist I really enjoyed. Um, I love Dan Millman's books because I always find there's there's so much grounded practical information in them. Um, that's what that's what really interests me. So let's say someone knows that they want to write a book and they're not sure where to start. What do they do when they contact you? Well, I am. Um, we usually have a little conversation. I do um, free twenty minute. You know, just getting to know you a little bit. Um, if they're really serious, because you know, a lot of people want to start a book, and in twenty minutes, you can usually find out if it's just a pipe dream. You know, uh, if if they're serious or not, if they understand what is entailed in that, and if they're not, then you know they'll go away, and it will just remain a pipe dream. If people are serious, then we usually have a an hour long session that they pay for, in which I get them to tell me everything everything they can tell me about what they want to write about. Because quite often I find that people want to write a book, they think it's about this. And then when we have a good conversation, I go, "Uh uh-huh, there's your book over there. Um, And they they suddenly realise that they do have a book in them, but it isn't necessarily what they thought it was. You know, I had a conversation with somebody recently who's an artist and he was saying he'd like to write a book and we were talking about various things. And then he started telling me about something he does. And I said, send that along to me. I'd like to have a look at that little course that he offers. And I looked at it and was blown away and said, there's your book. It's right there. Just expand on that. And it's a fabulous, fabulous thing. So, you know, usually it's let's sort out what you want to write, whether you've, you know, really serious about that, if you understand, you know, the pitfalls and the problems, because, you know, we all know people who started writing books and they still haven't finished them because, you know, it's it's too hard for them. Um, if somebody wants to go further, then I offer coaching um, and help them unravel their story and really build their story, build the architecture of it. Um, if they want me to ghost the book, um, I don't ghost many books these days. Um, but depending on the subject matter and the story, I could be persuaded. Um, it's, you know, the services I offer are a bit of a smorgasbord. They really do. It's not cookie cutter. It really does depend on the client and, um, you know, what the story is, what the market is, et cetera. Um, So, yeah, I don't believe in doing anything cookie cutter. Everyone's an individual and they have to be treated as an individual, just as with resonance marketing. I I agree with you completely on that. And it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of times people have a belief that they write a book and it's going to sell, be a New York Times bestseller list and Oprah's going to call them when that's probably not going to happen. Not to say that it couldn't, but the chances are very slim. Yeah. I had um, um, uh, somebody approach me a while back um, who is very wealthy, um, wants to be a spiritual teacher, thinks that he's got a process that his father taught him, um, didn't know where to go with that, And we had two or three conversations because I was trying to get the essence of what it was that he wanted to share. And I couldn't. And when I can't feel it, if I can't feel it and see it, then I know that it is still really ephemeral. You know, they haven't thought it through. He kept saying, I want to hire you, send me a contract. And I said, no, I can't do it because you don't have a book yet. You don't have a book and you can't be a spiritual teacher just based on that process that your father taught you. You know, it's not enough. And he was in love with the idea, just as you said. He wanted to be up there on a stage talking to people and be discovered by Oprah. 
And I said, you know, if you if you go away and, you know, learn more about yourself before you start wanting to teach other people. There's a lot that goes into that. They, from what I've heard, usually the people who have gone through life's greatest challenges are the ones that end up being life's greatest teachers. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, everybody's got a story, and I am a great believer in everybody should tell their story. One of the things that I'm always encouraging people to do, especially as they get older, is even if you write a book and just, you know, have 10 copies printed off for your family about your life, um, that is such an important thing to leave, not so much for your children, but for your grandchildren, because grandchildren never really know who their grandparents are. They only know the stories that their parents tell them or their grandparents tell them. But when you listen to the stories of some people, oh, my God, there's so much wisdom in them. And they they need to, I think it's good for children to, to know the lineage and the um, the experiences and the wisdom and the strengths that are in their lineage. So I wish everybody would do that and leave a story for their grandchildren about themselves. It doesn't have to be long, um, but I think it is something that the grandchildren would really treasure. Are there prompts that they can follow for that? So they yes. have a little bit of a nightlong? Yes, and I think that, you know, nowadays you can even – buy books that give you those prompts. You know, they've just got questions at the top of the page and tell you to fill them in. Um, you know, yes, I mean, it's very easy to tell somebody, okay, these are the questions. You go away and you answer those questions. And then you've got something there that you can then, um, you know, uh, expand upon. So when we look at just the whole process of book publishing, where do you think sometimes people get a little hung up? Well, I think they get hung up on, as you said, the dream rather than the reality. Um, and they also get hung up on thinking that they write the book and that's it. It's automatically going to sell. Um, and they don't realize, well, you know this one, how much they need to promote a book. That's one of the most important Things. Where are you going to find your readers? How are you going to talk to your readers, etc.? Um, I think so many people forget that part of it. And I've had people just fall away. You know, they've been very interested in writing their story, but once they realize they've then got to hire a publicist or they've got to do some promotion work themselves, uh, they can't face that. And yeah, so that can be challenging for a lot of people. If it, it, um, for most people, it brings them outside their comfort zone. Yeah, yeah, it does. So, looking back at all the work that you've done, what would you say you're the proudest of? I'm proud of the two magazines, Children of the New Earth and um, Planet Lightworker. Um, I am proud because I know how much they help people, especially. Children of the New Earth. That was at the beginning when everyone was talking about the indigo kids and people were just trying to work out what is happening with our children. Is it an evolutionary leap? You know, are they, um, you know, little crystal stars that have dropped down from heaven to to show us the way? What is it all about? And I I know for a fact that the magazines we published then were enormously helpful because I always believe in grounding information. They were very practical. Um, and um, they were very helpful to people. And I know that people have kept them as a collection, the printed ones. So I'm really proud of those. Um, and I'm really proud of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, because the more, the longer I'm working with it, the more I'm beginning to understand, here's another project that's doing me, rather than me doing it, and what its true purpose is. And I was at an event recently and somebody was asking me about it. And we realized that some of the luminaries that are giving us their 10 best books and giving it, giving, giving me interviews and talking about their, their life journey through the lens of their books is that what we're doing is we're capturing a piece of their legacy 
a piece of their wisdom and their knowledge um, that they might not be able to share in different kinds of interviews. And so it's enabling me to see that there is there's more than one purpose for this book club, more than one purpose. And um, I'm proud of that because when it first presented itself to me, I turned turned it away. I, you know, no, I wasn't going to do it. And I spent a year saying, no, I'm not going to do it. And eventually I decided I had to do it. Um, and it's one of those things that, you know, I spend more money on it than, than it earns for me. Um, but it is, I feel like it's a legacy project, not just for me, but for some of the guests that come on as well. What is it like for people if they want to submit their books or their work to you? What does that look like? If we're talking about people wanting me to help them with publishing their book or give them an evaluation, that's a different thing. People, I do do evaluations for books. Um, I do have to charge for that because you know, it takes a lot of time to read a book and then really tune into the person and, you know, the whole energy of the project and what I think the book could do, whether it's got a good market, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, people pay for that service. Um, but I always preface that with before you know, before you make the commitment, uh, you have to be okay if I say to you, your book needs a lot more work. Or, I'm sorry, you don't have a book here. Um, because I will, I can't, I can't lie to people. Um, you know, I feel so passionate about books and about people telling their stories that I would never want to lie to anybody and let them think that they had a good book if they didn't. You know, I tell them, go away. Maybe this isn't the book you've meant to write or let's have a chat and see what else, you know, you could get excited about that could work for you. Um, but I wouldn't want to say to someone, oh, yeah, you've got a great book there. Go ahead, you know, go to a hybrid company or I'll help you self-publish it when I know that it's it's not going to work for them. Especially when someone writes something, they really don't want to hear that it's probably not going to be up to par for what their expectations are. So how yeah. do you help them gain that clarity? Usually it's a process of talking to them. Um, and yeah, it's usually all in conversation. Um, what comes to my mind and as an example is a woman who wrote to me some years ago and she lost her husband and she was looking for something that you know, to keep herself occupied. And she decided to write a children's story and she wrote this story and sent it to me and said, what do you think? And we had a long chat about it. And I said, look, this this really should be in rhyme because it's a story that is aimed at, you know, the three, the four, the five-year-old, and they love rhyme. And I think it could be much more entertaining in rhyme. And, um, you know, why don't you go away and see what you can do with that? And she came back with the book in rhyme and she'd gone as far as finding an illustrator. And she had this fabulous little children's book there. And um, she eventually self-published it. As I said to her, it's very difficult to get children's books published. That's a really hard arena. Um, but she decided she just wanted to do this for herself and her family. So she had it pub published and printed and and then she started getting interest from some charities who wanted to share this book with, you know, young children at school. And now she's really, really happy. She hasn't sold, you know, thousands upon thousands of copies, but she's sold enough to really feel like, well, I'm an author. And her books are going into schools and being read by small children. So, you know, her expectations were never very, you know, big in the first place. So you've got to find out what someone's expectations are. If they want to write a book because they want satisfaction, you know, of having done it, um, and it's not about Oprah picking it up, then, you know, it's a lot easier for people. Um, so it's really about talking to people and finding out what's really driving, what's behind this, you know, urge to write a book and uh, hearing more about their story, because a lot of people don't know 
you know, where the real story lies. Have you also worked with screenwriters? Um, only, uh, only a couple. Only a couple. You know, it's, it's an area that really interests me. Um, it's so visual. Um, I've been involved in the theatre uh, very much. Um, and so, you know, the whole idea of, you know, writing scripts and directing people, um, that all kind of comes together. It's a whole other creative, um, you know, um, exercise. But I would love to work on scripts with people. I have um, done some books that, you know, lend themselves very well to being turned into screenplays. Um, you know, dialogue and, you know, some of the uh, uh, things, you know, true books, real books, real life books, um, you know, not fiction. Um, but no, I would say I don't have a great deal of experience in that area, but would be very interested in working in that if the opportunity arose. So, Sandy, where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your book club, your radio show and the work you do and be part of your community? Well. Sedgebeer.com, my last name, S-E-D-G-B-E-E-R.com is my website. It is also the home of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, although they will be divided soon. People can find out more about me, my background, um, the kinds of books I've worked on, etc. The um, clarity coaching that I do uh, there. They can also sign up for the No BS Spiritual Book Club. and. Um, get updated every week with new guests that are coming on the live streaming TV interview series. Um, So yeah, my website is the home of it all. One thing I will share with you, Marianne, and I don't know whether I'm jumping ahead of myself here, is that I've got some new ideas about the No BS Spiritual Book Club. And I know that we're almost out of time. So I won't share them here. But if people want to find out more, Um, about how they can engage with this book club in their own area and create something for themselves, go over to the website, sign up for the newsletter, and I will be announcing more details about it later. Well, that sounds so exciting. I can't wait to hear about that too. Sandy, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you, Marianne. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Well, thank you, Sandy. You've been one of my dear friends for such a long time. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your life from the edge of Om. If you'd like to connect with Sandy, please visit her website, sedgebeer.com. That's S-E-D-G-B-E-E-R.com. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we... Make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.